Tales You Lose by Archie Martin from Top Notch Magazine, November 1st, 1919. Bill Blake occupied the next bookkeeper's desk to mine in the office of Frank and Fearless Incorporated, the celebrated prune exporters. I had not paid much attention to Bill. In fact, I hardly knew he existed until one day he leaned across his desk and said confidentially, do you smoke? Wondering at the question, I nodded. I do, anything from cigarettes to fish. Why? Blake ran a hand over his head as full of hair as a billiard ball. I'll bet you ten dollars, he said, that you can't quit smoking for a month, thirty consecutive days. Perplexed, I stared at him and finally managed to pipe a weak question. What's the idea? Well, it's this way, Blake said thoughtfully. My doctor orders me to give up smoking, but I hate to do it alone. In fact, I'm afraid I can't. I was thinking that if I could get someone to go through the ordeal with me, it would be easier. What about it? I grabbed his hand enthusiastically. You're on, I hollered. I always did want to cut it out and save money. Two. Blake put me on my honor, and I put him on his. Once the bet was made, I tossed my pipe out the window and handed the elevator boy two big cigars I had in my pocket, thereby gaining his friendship for life. When I got home, I distributed the three packs of cigarettes and the two cans of tobacco in my room among my fellow boarders. Again, I put myself in solid, though one of them, a thin little shipping clerk, asked me if I felt sick or something. The first day I didn't have any trouble abstaining from smoking. The thought of winning ten dollars helped me to forget my after-breakfast cigarette, my after-dinner cigar, and my after-supper pipe. The second day, too, wasn't so bad, although I felt a trifle uneasy. Three days more, and the craving began, Following the advice of some friends, I began to chew gum to allay the demon nicotine. At the end of the day, I found my gum chewing cost me 45 cents. Aside from this, it made me so dry, I was compelled to drink at least 20 glasses of water. I quit only when the bunch at the office began calling me Camel. I didn't know how Blake was making out, except that he was grouchier than ever. Several more days went by. By this time, I felt about as cheerful as a man with a jumping tooth when the dentist is drilling around it. Again, my sympathizers who knew of the bet rushed to my assistance. This time, they told me to eat fruit, and desperate enough for anything, I followed their advice. Peaches, apples, pears, bananas, oranges. I was so full of them that I felt like a canning factory. The day dragged by until at last I resolved that if I didn't have a smoke, I might as well plug up my keyhole and make the gas trust richer. 3. The next morning I arrived at the office a little early, and as I glanced at my desk, there, in full view of my sunken eyes, lay a cigar, a panatella of the finest brand of tobacco, wearing a goldenrod band that nearly made my eyes pop out of my head. It was no use. Imagine a starving man who hasn't had a meal in days, a baseball fan who hasn't seen a game in years, a racehorse who hasn't seen a track, or a chauffeur who hasn't smelled gasoline. My sensations were no different. Besides, the spirit is willing to keep the bet, but the flesh is weak. With a yell, I grabbed the cigar, looked around, and, guilty as some schoolboy, broke the world's record getting to the washroom, where I lighted up. Oh, boy, what a sensation! I puffed and puffed like a steam engine. Certainly no cigar had ever been made 
as delicious as this one. I puffed and puffed until there was only one inch left, and I was regarding this inch lovingly when the washroom door opened and in walked my Betty, Bill Blake, with a cigar in his mouth as big as a policeman's club. He looked at me, and I looked at him. Ah, so you're smoking, he murmured through the cloud of blue smoke. I laughed. It seemed so, but uh, how about yourself? He removed his cigar and looked at it as if he were going to kiss it. Bets, he said are foolish so are doctor's orders he looked at me inasmuch as we have both lost i guess the only way to decide who's to win is to toss up a coin he dipped a hand into his vest pocket and produced a bright shiny half dollar i'll toss her up heads you win tails you lose this seemed fair and he flipped it up deftly catching it on the back of his hand. Tails, he cried, you lose. I handed him ten dollars, and we had two more cigars together. 4. Later, as Bill and I sat together at our desks, he reached into his vest pocket for an ink eraser he always carried there and pulled it out, together with a bright, shiny half dollar that cost me ten bucks. It fell to the floor with a jingle directly under my chair, and I reached over and picked it up. I had often heard of trick 50 cent pieces, but this one was the first I had ever seen. It was some freak. I looked for the head. There wasn't any. It was tails on both sides. Never mind the rest of the story. It isn't pleasant. The end of Tales You Lose by Archie Martin